Continuing our reading of Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity in Part 2, God and His Creation, Section 9, The Mercy of God. The next attribute is God's goodness or mercy. Mercy is the result and effect of God's goodness, Psalm 33, 5. So then this is the next attribute, God's goodness or mercy. The most learned of the heathens thought they gave their god Jupiter two golden characters when they styled him good and great. Both these meet in God, goodness and greatness, majesty and mercy. God is essentially good in himself and relatively good to us. They are both put together in Psalm 119, verse 68, Thou art good and doest good. This relative goodness is nothing else but his mercy, which is an innate propenseness in God to pity and succor such as are in misery. First, concerning God's mercy, I shall lay down these twelve positions. Number one, it is the great design of the Scripture to represent God as merciful. This is a lodestone to draw sinners to Him. The Lord, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, etc. Exodus 34, 6. Here are six expressions to set forth God's mercy, and but one to set forth His justice, who will by no means clear the guilty. Psalm 57, 10. God's mercy is far above the heavens, Psalm 108, verse 4. God is represented as a king with a rainbow about his throne in Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. The rainbow was an emblem of mercy. The scripture represents God in white robes of mercy more often than with garments rolled in blood, with his golden scepter more often than his iron rod. Number two, God is more inclinable to mercy than wrath. Mercy is his darling attribute, which he most delights in, Micah 7.18. Mercy pleases him. It is delightful to the mother, says Chrysostom, to have her breasts drawn. So it is to God to have the breasts of his mercy drawn. Fury is not in me, Isaiah 27.4. That is, I do not delight in it. Acts of severity are rather forced from God. He does not afflict willingly, Lamentations 3.33. The bee naturally gives honey, it stings only when it is provoked, so God does not punish till he can bear no longer, so that the Lord could bear no longer because of the evil of your doings, Jeremiah 44.22. Mercy is God's right hand that he is most used to. Inflicting punishment is called his strange work in Isaiah 28.21. He is not used to it. When the Lord would have shaven off the pride of a nation, he was said to hire a razor as if he had none of his own. He shall shave with a razor that is hired, Isaiah 7, 20. He is slow to anger, Psalm 103, verse 8, but ready to forgive, Psalm 86, 5. Number three, there is no condition, but we may spy mercy in it. When the church was in captivity, she cried out, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, in Lamentations 3, 22. Geographers write of Syracuse in Sicily that it is so situated that the sun is never out of sight. In all afflictions we may see some sunshine of mercy. That outward and inward troubles do not come together is mercy. Number four, mercy sweetens all God's other attributes. God's holiness without mercy and his justice without mercy were terrible. When the water was bitter and Israel could not drink, Moses cast a tree into the waters, and then they were made sweet. How bitter and dreadful were the other attributes of God did not mercy sweeten them. The mercy sets God's power on work to help us. It makes His justice become our friend. It shall avenge our quarrels. Number five, God's mercy is one of the most orient pearls of His crown. It makes His Godhead appear amiable and lovely. When Moses said to God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory, the Lord answered him, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will show thee mercy. Exodus thirty-three nineteen. God's mercy is his glory. His holiness makes him illustrious. His mercy makes him propitious. Number six, even the worst taste God's mercy, such as fight against God's mercy taste of it. The wicked have some crumbs from mercy's table. The Lord is good to all. Psalm 145, 9. Sweet dew drops are on the thistle as well as on the rose. The diocese where mercy visits is very large. Pharaoh's head was crowned, though his heart was hardened. Number seven, mercy coming to us in a covenant is sweetest. It was mercy that God would give Israel rain and bread to the full and peace and victory over their enemies, Leviticus 26, 4 through 6. But it was a greater mercy that God would be their God, verse 12. 
To have health is a mercy, but to have Christ and salvation is a greater mercy. It is like the diamond in the ring, which casts a more sparkling luster. Number eight, one act of mercy engages God to another. Men argue thus, I have shown you kindness already, therefore trouble me no more. But because God has shown mercy, he is more ready still to show mercy. His mercy in election makes him justify, adopt, glorify. One act of mercy engages God to more. A parent's love to his child makes him always giving. Number nine, all the mercy in the creature is derived from God and is but a drop of this ocean. The mercy and pity a mother has to her child is from God. He that puts the milk in her breasts puts the compassion in her heart. God is called the Father of mercies, because He begets all the mercies in the world. 2 Corinthians 1.3 If God has put any kindness into the creature, how much kindness is in Him who is the Father of mercy? Number 10. As God's mercy makes the saints happy, so it should make them humble. Mercy is not the fruit of our goodness, but the fruit of God's goodness. Mercy is an alms that God bestows. They have no cause to be proud that live upon the alms of God's mercy. If I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head, Job 10, verse 15. All my righteousnesses is the effect of God's mercy. Therefore I will humble myself and will not lift up my head. Number 11. Mercy stays the speedy execution of God's justice. Sinners continually provoke God and make the fury come in his face. Uh, Ezekiel 38:18. Whence is it that God does not presently arrest and condemn sinners? Is it not that God cannot do it? No, oh, he is armed with omnipotence, but it is from his mercy. Mercy gets a reprieve for the sinner and stops the speedy process of justice. God would by his goodness lead sinners to repentance. Number twelve, it is dreadful to have mercy as a witness against anyone. It was sad with Haman when the queen herself accused him, Esther 7, 6. So will it be when this queen of mercy shall stand up against a person and accuse him. It is only mercy that saves a sinner. How sad then to have mercy become an enemy. If mercy be an accuser, who shall be our advocate? The sinner never escapes hell when mercy draws up the indictment. I might show you several species or kinds of mercy as preventing mercy, sparing mercy, supplying mercy, guiding mercy, accepting mercy, healing mercy, quickening mercy, supporting mercy, forgiving mercy, correcting mercy, comforting mercy, delivering mercy, crowning mercy. But I shall speak of second the qualifications or properties of God's mercy. First, God's mercy is free. To set up merits is to destroy mercy. Nothing can deserve mercy because we are polluted in our blood, nor force mercy. We may force God to punish us, but not to love us. I will love them freely. Hosea 14.4 Every link in the chain of salvation is wrought and interwoven with free grace. Election is free. He hath chosen us in him according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1, 4. Justification is free, being justified freely by his grace. Romans 3, 24. Salvation is free. According to his mercy he saved us. Titus 3, 5. Say not then, I am unworthy, for mercy is free. If God should show mercy to such only as are worthy, he would show none at all. Second, God's mercy is an overflowing mercy. It is infinite, plenteous in mercy, Psalm 86, verse 5, rich in mercy, Ephesians 2, 4, a multitude of mercies in Psalm 51, 1. The vial of wrath drops, but the fountain of mercy runs. The sun is not so full of light as God is of mercy. God has morning mercies. His mornings are new every morning, Lamentations 3.23. He has night mercies. In the night his song shall be with me, Psalm 42, verse 8. God has mercies under heaven which we taste and in heaven which we hope for. Third, God's mercy is eternal. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 103, verse 17. His mercy endureth forever is repeated 26 times in one psalm, the 136th. The souls of the blessed shall be ever bathing themselves in this sweet and pleasant ocean 
of God's mercy. God's anger to his children lasts but a while, but his mercy lasts forever, Psalm 103, verse 9. As long as he is God, he will be showing mercy. As his mercy is overflowing, so it is ever flowing. Use 1. We are to look upon God in prayer, not in his judgment robes, but clothed with a rainbow full of mercy and clemency. Add wings to prayer. When Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven, that which made him go up thither with joy was, I go to my Father. So that which should make our hearts ascend with joy in prayer is, we are going to the Father of mercy who sits upon the throne of grace. Go with confidence in this mercy, as when one goes to a fire, not doubtingly, saying, perhaps it will warm me, perhaps not. Use to believe in his mercy. I will trust in the mercy of God forever. Psalm 52, verse 8. God's mercy is a fountain open. Let down the bucket of faith, and you may drink of this fountain of salvation. What greater encouragement to believe than God's mercy? God counts it his glory to be scattering pardons. He is desirous that sinners should touch the golden scepter of his mercy and live. This willingness to show mercy appears two ways. First, by entreating sinners to come and lay hold on his mercy. Whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Revelation 22:17. Mercy woos sinners. It even kneels down to them. It were strange for a prince to entreat a condemned man to accept of pardon. God says, Poor sinner, suffer me to love thee. Be willing to let me save thee. Second, by his joyfulness when sinners lay hold on his mercy. What is God the better whether we receive his mercy or not? What is the fountain profited that others drink of it? Yet such is God's goodness that he rejoices at the salvation of sinners and is glad when his mercy is accepted. When the prodigal son came home, the father was glad and made a feast to express his joy. God rejoices so when a poor sinner comes in and lays hold of his mercy. What an encouragement is here to believe in God. He is a God of pardons, Nehemiah 9.17. Mercy pleases him, Micah 7.18. Nothing prejudices us but unbelief. Unbelief stops the current of God's mercy from running. It shuts up God's bowels, closes the orifice of Christ's wounds, so that no healing virtue will come out. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief, Matthew 13.58. Why dost thou not believe in God's mercy? Do thy sins discourage thee? God's mercy can pardon great sins, nay, because they are great. Psalm 25, 2. The sea covers the rocks as well as the sands. Some that had a hand in crucifying Christ found mercy. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far is God's mercy above our sins. Isaiah 55, 9. What will tempt us to believe, if not the mercy of God? Use three. Take heed of abusing the mercy of God. Suck not poison out of the sweet flower of God's mercy. Think not that because God is merciful you may go on in sin. This is to make mercy your enemy. None might touch the ark but the priests who by their office were more holy. So none may touch the ark of God's mercy but such as are resolved to be holy. To sin because mercy abounds is the devil's logic. He that sins because of mercy is like one that wounds his head because he has a plaster. He that sins because of God's mercy shall have judgment without mercy. Mercy abused turns to fury. If he bless himself, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk after the imaginations of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst, the Lord will not spare him, but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. Deuteronomy 29, 19, and 20. Nothing is sweeter than mercy when it is improved. Nothing fiercer when it is abused. Nothing is colder than lead when taken out of the mine, and nothing more scalding than when lead is hot. Nothing is blunter than iron, yet nothing sharper when it's wetted. The mercy of the Lord is upon them that fear him, Psalm 103.17. Mercy is not for them that sin and fear not, but for them that fear and sin not. God's mercy is a holy mercy, where it pardons, it heals. You ask, what shall we do to be interested in God's mercy? First, be sensible of your wants. See how much you stand in need of pardoning, saving mercy. See yourselves orphans. In thee the fatherless find mercy. Hosea 14.3 God bestows the alms of mercy only on such as are indigent. Be emptied of all opinion of self-worthiness. God pours the golden oil of mercy into empty vessels. 
Second, go to God for mercy. Have mercy upon me, O God, Psalm 51, 1. Put me not off with common mercy that reprobates may have. Give me not only acorns, but pearls. Give me not only mercy to feed and clothe me, but mercy to save me. Give me the cream of thy mercies, Lord. Let me have mercy and loving kindness, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, Psalm 103, 4. Give me such mercy as speaks thy electing love to my soul. O oh, pray for mercy. God has treasures of mercy. Prayer is the key that opens these treasures. And in prayer, be sure to carry Christ in your arms, for all the mercy comes through Christ. Samuel took a sucking lamb, 1 Samuel 7, 9. Carry the lamb, Christ, in your arms. Go in his name. Present his merits. Say, Lord, here is Christ's blood, which is the price of my pardon. Lord, show me mercy, because Christ has purchased it. Though God may refuse us when we come for mercy in our own name, yet he will not when we come in Christ's name. Plead Christ's sanctification and satisfaction. And this is an argument that God cannot deny. Use 4. Such as have found mercy are exhorted to three things. 1. To be upon Gerizim, the mount of blessing and praising. They have not only heard the King of Heaven is merciful, but they have found it so. The honeycomb of God's mercy has dropped upon them. When in wants, mercy supplied them. When they were nigh unto death, mercy raised them from the sick bed. When covered with guilt, mercy pardoned them. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Psalm 103, verse 1. Oh, how should the vessels of mercy run over with praise? who was before a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, 1 Timothy 1.13. I was bemiracled with mercy, as the sea overflows and breaks down the banks. So the mercy of God broke down the banks of my sin, and mercy sweetly flowed into my soul. You that have been monuments of God's mercy should be trumpets of praise. You that have tasted the Lord is gracious. Tell others what experiences you have had of God's mercy, that you may encourage them to seek to Him for mercy. I will tell you what God hath done for my soul, Psalm 66, 16, that when I found my heart dead, God's Spirit came upon me mightily, and the blowing of that wind made the withering flowers of my grace revive. Oh, tell others of God's goodness, that you may set others blessing Him, and that you may make God's praises live when you are dead. Second, to love God. Mercy should be the attraction of love. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Psalm 18.1 The Hebrew word for love signifies love out of the inward bowels. God's justice may make us fear Him. His mercy makes us love Him. If mercy will not produce love, what will? We are to love God for giving us our food, much more for giving us grace, for sparing mercy, much more for saving mercy. Sure that heart is made of marble, which the mercy of God will not dissolve in love. I would hate my own soul, says Augustine, if I did not find it loving God. Third, to imitate God in showing mercy. As God the Father of mercy, show yourselves to be His children by being like Him. Ambrose says the sum and definition of religion is be rich in works of mercy, be helpful to the bodies and souls of others, scatter your golden seeds, let the lamp of your profession be filled with the oil of charity, be merciful in giving and forgiving, be ye merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Section 10. The Truth of God the next attribute is God's truth, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, Deuteronomy 32.4. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds, Psalm 57.10. Plenteous in truth, Psalm 86.15. Firstly, God is the truth. He is true in a physical sense, true in his being. He has a real subsistence and gives a being to others. He is True in a moral sense. He is true without errors, without deceit. God is the pattern and prototype of truth. There is nothing true but what is in God or comes from God. Secondly, God's truth as it is taken from his veracity in making good his promises. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise. First Kings 8.56 
The promise is God's bond. God's truth is the seal set to his bond. There are two things to be observed in the promises of God to comfort us. One, the power of God, whereby he is able to fulfill the promise. God has promised to subdue our corruption. He will subdue our iniquities, Micah 7.19. Oh, says a believer, my corruption is so strong that I am sure I shall never get the mastery of it. Abraham looked at God's power, being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform, Romans 4.21. He believed that God, who could make a world, could make dry breasts give suck. It is faith's support that there is nothing too hard for God. He that could bring water out of a rock is able to bring to pass his promises. Two, the truth of God in the promises. God's truth is the seal set to the promise. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie hath promised. Titus 1, 2. Eternal life, there is the sweetness of the promise. God which cannot lie, there is the certainty of it. Mercy makes the promise, truth fulfills it. God's providences are uncertain, but his promises are the sure mercies of David. Acts 13.34 God is not a man that he should repent, 1 Samuel 15.29 The word of a prince cannot always be taken, but God's promise is inviolable. God's truth is one of the richest jewels of his crown, and he has pawned it in a promise. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, 2 Samuel 23.5. Although my house be not so, that is, though I fail much of that exact purity the Lord requires, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, that he will pardon, adopt, and glorify me, and this covenant is ordered in all things, and sure. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, but this covenant abides firm and inviolable, being sealed with the truth of God. Nay, God has added to his word his oath, wherein he pawns his being, life and righteousness, to make good the promise, Hebrews 6.17. As if, as often as we break our vows with God, he should break promise with us, it would be very sad, but his truth is engaged in his promise. Therefore it is like the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be altered. We are not, says Chrysostom, to believe our senses so much as we are to believe the promises. Our senses may fail us, but the promise cannot, being built upon the truth of God. God will not deceive the faith of his people. Nay, he cannot. God who cannot lie hath promised. He can as well part with his deity as his verity. God is said to be abundant in truth. Exodus 34, 6. What is that? If God has made a promise of mercy to his people, he will be so far from coming short of his word that he will be better than his word. He often does more than he has said. Nevertheless, he is abundant in truth. First, the Lord may sometimes delay a promise, but he will not deny. He may delay a promise. God's promise may lie a good while as seed underground, but at last it will spring up into a crop. He promised to deliver Israel from the iron furnace, but this promise was above 400 years in travail before it brought forth. Simeon had a promise that he should not depart hence till he had seen the Lord's Christ, Luke 2.26, but it was a long time first, uh, but a little before his death that he did see Christ. But though God delay the promise, he will not deny. Having given his bond in due time, the money will be paid. Second, God may change his promise, but he will not break it. Sometimes God changes a temporal promise into a spiritual. The Lord shall give that which is good, Psalm 85.12, which may not be fulfilled in a temporal sense, but a spiritual. God may let a Christian be cut short in temporals, but he makes it up in spirituals. If he does not increase the basket and the store, he gives increase of faith and inward peace. Here he changes his promise, but he does not break it. He gives that which is better. If a man promises to pay me in farthings, and he pays me in a better coin, as in gold, he does not break his promise. I will not suffer my faithfulness to fail, Psalm 89.33. In Hebrew, it is to lie. You ask, how does it consist with the truth of God that he will have all to be saved, and yet some perish? 1 Timothy 2.4 Augustine understands it not of every individual person, but some of all sorts shall be saved. 
As in the ark, God saved all the living creatures. Not every bird or fish was saved, for many perished in the flood, but all that is some of every kind were saved. So he will have all to be saved, that is, some of all nations." It is said, you say, Christ died for all. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29, how does this consist with God's truth, you ask, when some are vessels of wrath? Romans 9.22. First, we must qualify the term world. The world is taken either in a limited sense for the world of the elect or in a larger sense for both elect and reprobates. Christ takes away the sins of the world, that is, the world of the elect. Second, we must qualify also Christ's dying for the world. Christ died sufficiently for all, not effectually. There is the value of Christ's blood and the virtue Christ's blood has value enough to redeem the whole world, but the virtue of it is applied only to such as believe. Christ's blood is meritorious for all, not efficacious. Not all are saved because some put away salvation from them, as in Acts 13.46, and vilify Christ's blood, counting it an unholy thing, Hebrews 10.29. Use 1. The truth of God is a great pillar for our faith. Were not he a God of truth, how could we believe in him? Our faith were fancy. But he is truth itself, and not a word which he has spoken shall fall to the ground. Truth is the object of trust. The truth of God is an immovable rock on which we may venture our salvation. Isaiah 49.15 Truth faileth, truth on earth does, but not truth in heaven. God can as well cease to be God as cease to be true. Has God said that he will do good to the soul that seeks him? Lamentations 3.25 And he will give rest to the weary? Matthew 11.28 Here is a safe anchor hold. He will not alter the thing which has gone out of his lips. The public faith of heaven is engaged for believers. Can we have better security? The whole earth hangs upon the word of God's power, and shall not our faith hang upon the word of God's truth? Where can we rest our faith but upon God's faithfulness? There is nothing else we can believe in but the truth of God. To trust in ourselves is to build upon quicksands, but the truth of God is a golden pillar for faith to stay upon. God cannot deny himself. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself, Second Timothy 2.13. Not to believe God's veracity is to affront God. He that believeth not hath made God a liar, First John 5.10. A person of honor cannot be more affronted or provoked than when he is not believed. He that denies God's truth makes the promise no better than a forged deed. And can there be a greater affront offered to God? Use too. If God is a God of truth, he is true to his threatenings. The threatenings are a flying roll against sinners. God has threatened to wound the hairy scalp of everyone that goes on still in his trespasses. Psalm 68.21 He has threatened to judge adulterers, Hebrews 13.4, to be avenged upon the malicious, Psalm 10.14 Thou beholdest mischief and spite, to requite it with thine own hand, and to rain fire and brimstone upon the sinner, Psalm 11.6 God is as true to his threatenings as to his promises. To show his truth, he has executed his threatenings, and let his thunderbolts of judgment fall upon sinners in this life. He struck Herod in the act of his pride. He has punished blasphemers. Olympias, an Arian bishop, reproached and blasphemed the Blessed Trinity, and immediately lightning fell down from heaven upon him and consumed him. Let us fear the threatening that we may not feel the threatening. Use 3. Is God a God of truth? Let us be like God in truth. First, we must be true in our words. Pythagoras, being asked what made men like God, answered when they speak truth. It is the note of a man that shall go to heaven. He speaketh the truth in his heart. Psalm 15, 2. Truth in words as opposed, first, to lying. Putting away lying, speak every one truth to his neighbor. Ephesians 4, 25. Lying is when one speaks that for truth, which he knows to be false. A liar is most opposite to the God of truth. 
There are, as Augustine says, two sorts of lies, an officious lie, when a man tells a lie for his profit, as when a tradesman says his commodity cost him so much, when perhaps it did not cost him half so much. He that will lie in his trade shall lie in hell. A jesting lie, when a man tells a lie in sport to make others merry and goes laughing to hell. He who tells a lie makes himself like the devil. The devil is a liar and the father of it, John 8.44. He deceived our first parents by a lie. Some are so wicked that they will not only speak an untruth, but they will swear to it. Nay, they will wish a curse upon themselves if that untruth be not true. I have read of a woman, one Anne Avery, who in 1575, being in a shop, wished that she might sink if she had not paid for the wares she took and fell down speechless immediately and died. A liar is not fit to live in a commonwealth. Lying takes away all society and converse with men. How can you converse with a man when you cannot believe what he says? Lying shuts men out of heaven. Without are dogs, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, Revelation 22.15. As it is a great sin to tell a lie, so it is a worse sin to teach a lie. The prophet that teacheth lies, Isaiah 9.15. He who broacheth error teacheth lies. He spreads the plague. He not only damns himself, but helps to damn others. Second, truth in words is opposed to dissembling. The heart and tongue should go together, as the dial goes exactly with the sun. To speak fair to one's face and not to mean what one speaks is no better than a lie. His words were smoother than oil, but war was in his heart. Psalm 55:21. Some have an art to flatter and hate. Jerome, speaking of the Arians, says, They pretended friendship. They kissed my hands, but plotted mischief against me. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Proverbs 29:5. As it is said, cruel poison can be hidden under sweet honey. Falsehood in friendship is a lie. Counterfeiting friendship is worse than counterfeiting money. Second, we must be true in our profession of religion. Let practice go along with profession. Righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4.24. Hypocrisy in religion is a lie. The hypocrite is like a face in a mirror, which is the show of a face, but no true face. He makes a show of holiness, but has no truth in it. Ephraim pretended to be that which he was not, and what says God of him? Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, Hosea 11.12. By a lie in our words, we deny the truth. By a lie in our profession, we disgrace it. Not to be to God what we profess is telling a lie, and the Scripture makes it little better than blasphemy. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, Revelation 2.9. Oh, I beseech you, labor to be like God. He is a God of truth. He can as well part with his deity as his verity. Be like God. Be true in your words. Be true in your profession. God's children are children that will not lie. Isaiah 58, 8. When God sees truth in the inward parts and lips in which there is no guile, he sees his own image, which draws his heart towards us. Likeness produces love. And thus far the reading of Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail 
at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.